So, this evening, we want to talk about miracles. It's not the type of message I normally do, so please bear with me. But I want to talk about the topic of miracles and what makes a miracle and what defines a miracle and what miracles do. I want to look at three very specific miracles because they have three very specific properties that we need to look at if we're going to understand the concept of miracles. I want to look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, which says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and this is interactive. And the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What is the miraculous thing about this? We tend to look at this one as being a very small thing. It's just sort of a footnote to the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now let's talk about plants and trees and birds and rocks and water and wind and stars and... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made everything that is, or was, or ever will be. What's the miracle here? God speaks, and it happens. And why do I begin with this miracle? Because it's the first one in the book, silly. That's right, but... What does this miracle teach us about the nature of all miracles? When we encounter opposition to the idea of a miracle, what's the first thing our atheist friends will say? Oh, miracles can't happen because they just can't happen. Right? You tell someone about Jesus and five loaves of bread and two fish feeding 20,000 people and they laugh. Oh, that's a silly idea. Couldn't possibly happen because, you know, mathematically, there's not enough food there. No, no, no. They're missing the point. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Is there anything outside of the scope of that domain? No. Everything we know, everything we see, everything we experience is a direct creation of what God does in that one little verse that we skip over. So it shouldn't surprise us later on that God can feed 20,000 people with a little boy's lunch. It shouldn't surprise us that Jesus demonstrates his mastery over the elements by walking on the lake. It shouldn't surprise us because these are little tiny things. These are little tiny things compared to, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is a rabbinical principle. The rabbis say, if you want to find out what something is, find it in the Bible. Find the first place it appears in the Bible. The book of Genesis is really important. Find the first place it occurs in the Bible, and that will give you an overarching idea of what a thing is. It doesn't get any earlier than Genesis 1.1. See, God introduces himself by performing a miracle. By performing the biggest and most spectacular miracle that we can see. God is in absolute control over everything that is. Now, The second miracle I want to look at occurs in 1 Kings chapter 18. This is the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. 
Well, preacher, that's a pretty scary story, and we really don't want to talk about that on Christmas Eve. We want to look at that miracle for a couple of interesting reasons. Does everybody know the story? Basically, there were some... There were 450 prophets of this false god in Israel, and the queen of Israel was a wicked woman who was supporting these 450 prophets, and she was worshiping with them. And there was just Elijah left. And Elijah goes and he says, look, let's find out who is God. Let's find out if the Lord Almighty is God, or let's find out if Baal is God, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to make two sacrifices. One, you get to pick. You can set up your your altar and you, you pick the sacrifice and you take all 450 of your prophets and you call down fire from heaven. And I, by my little lonesome, will make my altar and I'll make my sacrifice and I will call down fire from heaven and the God who answers, he is God. So Elijah takes a seat early in the morning. He wants to let them go first. And the 450 prophets of Baal, they build their altar and they sacrifice their bull and they put it on the altar and they call out to Baal, trying to convince Baal to rain down fire from heaven and accept their sacrifice. And Elijah spends the day taunting them, the whole day. There's a very important verse that I want to focus on in this segment. Elijah spends the whole day taunting them, and eventually they give up. They decide, well, Baal didn't send down fire from heaven, but his God's not going to send down fire from heaven either, and we're not going to have an answer. And Elijah says, go get some water. And fill these jars and drench my sacrifice. And then do that three times. Cover the animal and the, the, the altar and, and build a trench around the sacrifice to contain the water. Because Elijah understands what's about to happen. The verse I want to focus on in this whole story is at about the time of the oblation. Elijah calls out to God. And we know the end of the story, of course. Fire comes down from heaven, not only consumes the wet sacrifice, but consumes the wood, consumes the the stones, and the water itself catches fire. But let's look at that at about the time of the oblation. Elijah doesn't demand God act at a different time. What is the oblation? Does anybody know? The oblation is the time of the giving of the sacrifice. See, Elijah understood that he needed to act in God's time. Elijah understood that while he was squaring off against the prophets of Baal, that while he was certainly doing a good work for the name of the God of Israel, he still needed to behave in God's time. (sighs) Hebrews chapter 2 Verses 3 through 4. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to His will. What's the, what's the purpose of the miracle? Why did God answer With fire. Because the prophet demanded it? No. Of course not. God answered by fire because he wanted to validate his message. 
He wanted to validate what the prophet was saying. The prophet was speaking the truth. Baal is not God. Our God is God. So the fire comes down. And God bears witness. God bears witness. He validates. He encourages the message. By this miraculous and showy sign of fire falling from heaven. Now the third miracle I want to look at is the one that Chris read for us. It's the virgin birth. It's not big and flashy like Genesis 1.1. It doesn't encompass everything that is. And it's not dramatic and Hollywood special effects like like Elijah on Mount Carmel. This miracle is quiet. This miracle happens in the middle of a crowded city and nobody knows it. This miracle comes to a young virgin girl named Mary and her betrothed named Joseph. Now, of course, there are the angels who announce to the shepherds. But who are they? They're just shepherds. It's not even like they were the king's shepherds. It's not like they were tending the king's flock. They're just shepherds. So, this miracle which is not as special effects type flashy as the fire from heaven. It's not as all-encompassing as Genesis 1-1. This miracle changes everything. What does this miracle show us? Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive... And give birth to a son. And we'll call him Emmanuel. This is God actively creating. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. He speaks these things into existence. And in 1 Kings, God sends the fire from heaven at the prophet's behest. The prophet does everything right. He waits until the time of the oblation when God is to receive the sacrifice. And then he calls for God to receive the sacrifice. But here, how does Mary call for the miracle? How does Joseph create the miracle? It's a trick question. They don't. The prophet calls for fire from heaven But Mary simply says, may it be to me as you have said. Mary simply submits herself in willing obedience to God's will. Now, like we said, the primary purpose of a miracle is to validate a message. But what does that mean? God shows in this validation that he is involved in whatever is happening. God also adds emphasis to the event with the miracle. This is God's way of saying, pay attention. All right. That's enough of of an understanding of miracles. Let's deal with the miracle we're here to remember tonight. One of my favorite radio commentators, and I bet... But a lot of you have fond memories of him as well. Paul Harvey tells a story of an atheist who sits at home and he helps his wife get ready for church and he ushers her out the door and he can't believe in all this malarkey. He can't believe in this whole idea that God became a man because how silly is that? He can't believe in the idea of the incarnation, which is a big word we slap on this to make ourselves 
look smart. And so this, this atheist man sits in his living room after his wife leaves for church. And he puts his feet up next to the fire. And he cracks open the newspaper. And he sits to read. And it's not long before he hears a sound at his window. And he hears it again. And he hears it again. And he, he decides that it must be kids throwing snowballs against the glass, trying to rouse him from whatever he's doing, trying to destroy the peace of his evening. And so the man gets up and he goes to the window to open it and shake his fist at the kids and what he finds is a flock of birds outside of his window on the snow. They see the warmth of the fire and they're trying to get in because the cold is killing them. But they can't get through the window. And the man decides, well, I've got that nice barn out back. And the hayloft is just lined with hay. Wouldn't that be a wonderful place for the birds to take refuge? And so the man puts on his boots and his, his, his overcoat and he goes and he opens the barn door and he turns on the light so that the birds will see. But they don't go. And the man ponders this for a while and he, he tries to call to the birds. He tries to yell to them, Come, come, there's warmth and light and shelter. And they don't come. And he decides to run over to the birds and wave his arms to try to frighten them into the barn. But the birds just scatter to the wind. And the man thinks, if only I could convince these birds to go into the barn. I can't, I can't call to them. I can't frighten them in. But what if I could lead them in? What if I could communicate with them? What if I became a bird? What if I became a bird and I flew into the barn? And I showed them, and all of a sudden it hit him. This whole silly idea of the doctrine of the incarnation, this whole silly idea of God becoming a man, it sank in all at once. Mr. Harvey says the man fell to his knees and prayed to the God he hadn't believed in 30 seconds ago. This is my favorite. I love this story. And I will close with this. By Christmas of 1914, nearly one million men had died in the fighting along the Western Front. Men who had experienced or had expected the war to be over by Christmas had settled into fortified trenches and the war became a deadly stalemate. But in the week leading up to Christmas, something amazing was happening. In scattered areas along the front, British and German soldiers began to cross the area between the trenches known as no man's land and exchange small gifts and Christmas greetings. Graham Williams of the 5th London Rifle Brigade wrote that first the Germans would sing one of their carols then we would sing one of ours until we started up, O come all ye faithful. And the Germans immediately joined in, singing the Latin words, Adeste Fideles. And I thought, well, this really is a most extraordinary thing. Two nations both singing the same carol in the middle of a war. His German counterpart, Josef Sulward, of the 17th Bavarian Regiment, recalled, I shouted to our enemies that we didn't wish to shoot and that we would make a Christmas truce. I said I would come from my side and we could speak to each other. First there was silence. Then I shouted once more, inviting them, and the British soldiers shouted, no shooting. 
This outbreak of human decency in the midst of what was arguably the most senseless carnage in human history culminated on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, 1914, exactly 100 years ago today. Along the front, some, but not all, British and German officers negotiated a 48-hour truce. Men on both sides sang together, exchanged gifts, and even played soccer. What does that have to do with fire from heaven? What does that have to do with in the beginning God created? What does that have to do with the baby in a manger? I'll tell you, everything. That miracles aren't always flashy. Miracles aren't always big. Miracles aren't always loud. Sometimes miracles take place in the changing of a human heart. Where we submit ourselves to God's will. Where we say, I want none of me and all of you. And these miracles change the world. A hundred years later, we remember this story. A hundred years later, we feel a spark of hope rise up within us that soldiers can put down their guns and play soccer because a baby was born to a virgin who submitted herself willingly to God's will. Miracles happen. They happen in big ways like creation. They happen in spectacular ways like with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. They happen in quiet ways like with Mary and Joseph in the silence of that holy night. But they keep happening. They happen inside each of us as we come to Christ, as we kneel at the cross, as we bow our hearts in submission to His holy and perfect will. Christ comes to each of us in a miraculous way. Like Elijah, we must wait on the Lord's timing. Like Mary, we must open ourselves to the Lord's will. Are you waiting? Are you open? Are you looking for the miracle that will come? Because it will. Our God, our God is a great God. And He will come. 